Thanks for listening to the Wild Health Podcast. For the foreseeable future, you're not going to hear our normal intro or outro here. We're going to be releasing episodes very frequently as things are changing. This channel will be used for a very specific purpose. Number one, to communicate with our patients. We're somewhat overwhelmed, and the more we can communicate breaking news and recommendations from us to our patients all at once, the better. So if you're a patient, we're here for you if you need us. But if possible, please tune in here so we can both keep you up to date and conserve our time for the most critical tasks. Feel free to share this with friends and colleagues as well. Number two, we've organized as a group. We have infectious disease specialists, ER doctors, critical care doctors, and in total dozens of MDs, PhDs, and frontline clinicians who are going to be constantly evaluating the news and emerging evidence. We're then going to summarize and translate that for you here every day on the podcast. The speed of change with the circumstances will make us look foolish at times, but we're committed to pouring all of our resources and energy into doing what we can to help and make a difference. You can also follow our updates at wildhealth.com or our Instagram account at wildhealthmd. And if you're a patient, we're here for you. Please tune in here for the updates and let us know how we can help. Dr. Sinclair, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we got a, your email newsletter about a week ago. If, if people don't follow that, they really should. If you go to lifespanbook.com, you can get that newsletter. And it was really insightful. We thought it was really well done. And we wanted to talk to you and get your perspective on everything that's going on. So I guess what I'd like to know right now is we're talking to people all around the world, and the situation seems to be a little different everywhere. There's a lot of um, a lot of fear. Uh, it's not good anywhere, but how is it right there locally where you are? Well, so I'm on Cape Cod here where it's a beach community. So there's, there's not much activity. People are keeping their distance. Very rarely do you see people walking outside, walking their dogs. Um, it was a little different when I was sh- shuttering my lab, uh, winding it down at Harvard Medical School, which was, you know, that Longwood area, um, in um, Massachusetts is, I think there's about eight hospitals within a few blocks of each other, and it was pretty hectic. But um, it's pretty calm down here right now. Um, but there's not much food left in supermarkets, and toilet paper ran out weeks ago. But other than that, it's just um, a matter of trying to keep my family uh, from killing each other, and, and that's going okay so far. <laughs> so far. It's good. Matt mentioned Yeah, that. three days. Teenage kids, uh, you guys know how it is. Totally, totally. Matt mentioned that um, you've been uh, you've been pretty active uh, with some of your coverage of, of COVID, and specifically your Twitter account has been one of the one of the few that I've I've been looking at most uh, regularly to to try to keep up to date. You've done a really good job of finding some of the best articles and some of the best scientific research. What's your process for doing that? How are you going? day by day and, and finding this this information so that you can curate it for the public? Yeah, well, so I, I have a couple of things on my side. Um, so normally I, I, I'm, I'm known for studying health and longevity, but uh, my PhD is in molecular genetics and microbiology. So that comes in handy. I'm also, I also have an insatiable curiosity and I'm also trained to digest a lot of information very quickly, uh, read papers, find out what's true, what isn't. A lot of the science that's coming out right now um, out of China, now out of Europe, a little more in the US these days, um, It's most of it's not peer reviewed. There's no time for our colleagues to peer review this. So it's up to scientists like me um, to look at it and see is it is it reliable is it real and it takes a long time actually to do our own peer review of these papers um, but it's really busy I, i'm i'm up till early hours of the morning reading things researching things making connections um if you could i could turn my computer around you can see um it's all yellow sticky notes all <laughs> over uh, this is this is my desk trying to organize all the information coming in it's coming in thick and fast and I'm trying to put things together and and translate them for people who are not scientists, so that they can follow what's important to know. So let me ask you about your opinion on a couple of things, then, because we try to be very science backed here and just give the facts. And what we don't want to do ever is get political because it just is not helpful. But as a scientist of your standing, what is your take right now on? 
the U.S. response and the social distancing programs, do you think we've done enough? Do you think we were too late? Do you think we need to do more? If you were making policy, how would you change what's going on right now? Um, yeah, well, so an another doctor who's on social media and I, I follow is Eric Topol, and he last night uh, sent out a tweet that was pretty interesting. He wrote, um, in the future, there will be a book on how to mess up the response to a pandemic. And he listed eight things that uh, the US had done wrong. And, and you know, I'm not gonna reiterate that, you can check it out, but uh, being involved in developing kits for detection of viruses is one of the companies that I co-founded called ArcBio. Um, I've seen what it's like uh, trying to get kits out there. A lot of hospitals have reached out to me to find kits because they're, they're des there's a desperate shortage and I, uh, through social media, reached out to the world saying, if you need equipment, let me know because I've got contacts, particularly in China, where they have uh, an excess of equipment that they're re ready to share or sell. And through that, uh, I could see firsthand how hospitals have run low, companies have run low on all of this equipment, including tests. Um, but I think that the biggest disappointment for me was that our tests didn't work at first or not were, were not reliable. And uh, the way I understand it is that the kit was designed poorly. And, you know, I'm quoting another scientist, but apparently a graduate student could have done a better job. I don't know if that's true, but if it is, you know, we have a lot of lessons to learn here um, in terms of stockpiling equipment for hospitals uh, and getting ready to distribute kits and getting the laws in place that allow companies to sell these things. And right now, um, if I believe what I'm reading on um, the internet, the FDA has now banned home testing kits that people could buy and test if they have the disease or, or not. Um, to me, that that's also a strange thing to do. I mean, we need people to be you know, equipped to do this because there aren't enough kits out there anyway. And you don't want everybody who has a sniffle or a cough to go into the doctor's office or into the ER at all. I mean, that's gonna make things worse. So, you know, those are some examples, but overall I've been really disappointed um, with the US response compared to some other nations. Uh, but I also know that the US is extremely entrepreneurial and business savvy and we're, we're catching up, um, but we've lost a few weeks. The, with regard to the testing, I feel like it's been really hard to, to follow the progression of the virus in this country because testing has been so there's been such a dearth of testing. Um, what are you using right now? Should, should we be losing, should we be looking at death rate? Should we be looking at the doubling of death rate and testing? Is there another marker that we can use to assess how quickly things are progressing here in the U S? Yeah. And we really only those numbers of number of cases confirmed suspected cases, ICU cases and deaths um, and you can juggle those numbers any way you want you put that on the map and you get some idea what's going on uh, estimates range widely from there being 20 times as many cases as are confirmed up to 50 based on experts which is a scary number either way um, but i think what what i what i can tell you is the first number that i look at when i wake up are, are uh, the number of cases um, and the, the number of deaths is a little bit less indicative because it's usually behind the number of cases, right? Um, takes a week or two for people to succumb to this. Uh, but, you know, nevertheless, even though it's not an accurate number, you look at New York now and the number of cases is doubling every two days. Uh, uh, it was said that if it gets below three, the hospital system will be overwhelmed. So we're now at that, at that point. What do you guys think? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you my thoughts on this. So they've changed, honestly, in the last 24 hours. I thought, you know what, the number of cases, I can't rely on that because the testing has changed. I said that's a factor of the number of tests we're doing. I thought, you know what, the deaths, that's a hard number. We can rely on that. But I tell you what, David, last night I worked a shift in the ER and I had two elderly patients with respiratory distress who died. And neither of them were going to get tested. They're not, not going to get counted. Several other respiratory patients who were ill None of them got tested. We don't have the test for it. So I just realized that even the number of deaths that were being reported, 
we really have no idea because of the testing problem. So I just don't know how to follow this. I tell you, on the ground, it feels like it's much worse than some of the numbers we're seeing reported, but I don't know a good way to track it, honestly. Mm. Yeah, well, the, I mean, we're all getting a little bit tired of the graphs every day because it's it's grim. Um, but what I mean, while we're on the topic, it's worth mentioning that in the beginning of the the outbreak here, you, you know, let's go back just even a few weeks ago when things started to really go south. The um, I was tracking the numbers of U.S. versus Italy, and we were ten days behind. But every day we were tracking almost identically. It was almost uncanny. But then they started to to diverge, and it turns out. The U.S. has now exceeded the rate of growth of Italy um, that they were at. And we know what happened in Italy. Elderly were just dying without ventilators. And that's going to happen here, too, in particularly in cities where the doubling rate is more than a is worse than three. But I think even at a number like every four days doubling or six days doubling, it can overwhelm uh, healthcare systems. Yeah, and when I, I remember looking at that graph that you did in the newsletter, I thought it was really well done. And I remember the thoughts I had when I looked at it were, well, one thing we have going for us in the U.S. is we're so spread out. So some of the rural areas may not be as hard to hit. Maybe there's some cushion in the system where we can send ventilators from Nebraska to New York City. But then, again, my experience is that it feels like even in rural Kentucky, um, th there is spread. So I really think we just need to get super aggressive. But, but even if we are able to mitigate right now through social isolation and distancing, do you think we're destined for a second wave if we can't develop a vaccine or find adequate treatment options? Or how, how do we mitigate that second spike that we're starting to maybe see in Hong Kong or some other places? Right, right. Uh, well, I, it's all going to depend on how we behave. That's what it comes down to. The vaccine is somewhere between if the Chinese are successful a year away or 18 months. Um, and that's optimistic. If, if the vaccines don't work or there's safety issues, it could be longer than that. So this, this virus is going to be around until we, until we are all vaccinated or about half of us have caught it. In the meantime, we're going to have to change the way we live. Now, I don't think the economy of the planet um, US included, of course, uh, can survive a few months of this. Uh, we're going to have to figure out ways to, to to live. And what I predict, although it's dangerous because things change by the day, um, is that we, we'll bring this down. It seems like Italy's turned the corner. We will, too, hopefully, and get this down sometime, I would now say, more like end of May, June. It's, it's further out than most people used to predict. Um, I think over the summer, um, I go back and forth whether temperature and humidity are going to make a difference. I think it will help. It's not going to be the cure. It's not going to go away like flu. Uh, but it could come back to bite us like it did in 1918 when the flu came back and was seemingly even worse. That's the risk. Um, but I think what we're going to be able to do as a society is what Asia is doing. And they, they didn't go back to a normal way of life. They've gone back to somewhat uh, workable situation where you, you go to work. Um, but you also practice social distancing and you wash your hands and you scan before you go into major buildings. And that's what it'll be like probably for another two years, I guess. So that 12 months to 18 months that you mentioned for a vaccine, uh, it, less than 30 minutes ago, I asked Dr. Taylor Bright, who's sitting next to me actually here. He's our director of infectious disease, has a PhD in genomics and infectious disease. The number he predicted was kind of that 18 months. Do you, is that kind of what you're thinking as well? I know we're asking you to predict the future, which is impossible, but with your level of expertise, I think your, your thoughts on that matter. Well, yeah, I've got my finger on the pulse as well. I agree uh, with that estimate that 18 months is the right timeline. If you, I mean, we, we could develop a vaccine, you know, I could, I could go to my lab today and make recombinant protein and inject it into my body with an adjuvant and pray that it works. But it, that's super risky because we, we know with SARS-1 that monkeys, given a certain type of vaccine that targeted the same spike protein as the vaccines are today being developed, that it was actually, it had a deleterious effect on the monkeys. So you, you really have to be careful about this. And that's why it takes so long, is that you have to have these rigorous clinical trials. So 18 months is sounds right to me for any efforts in the US. Though I'm optimistic someone will succeed because... At last count, um, 
you know, roughly 30 vaccine trials around the world and now 60 drug and vaccine trials total. I mean, it's hard to keep count. I don't know if the numbers have changed since I last looked a few days ago, but it's a lot of stuff going on. And I'm encouraged by the fact that in the history of life on this earth, a species has never been united against a single foe. David, that's that's interesting that the monkeys actually had a negative effect from the vaccine. Is that typical of viral vaccines that are in development that you actually see an, an increase in infectivity from giving the vaccine? Um, well, I, I, I don't think it was the infectivity. I think it was the, their ability to clear the virus that was affected. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. This was the first vaccine that I saw that had a negative effect. Um but I don't know how common that is. Perhaps one of your experts knows that. So one of the questions that we're getting a lot in regards to that, kind of along the same lines, is some people just, I just got this question yesterday, a young, healthy, 30-something-year-old uh, texted me, why don't I just go ahead and get infected uh, and get it over with, and then I'll be immune? And uh, my answer to him was, well, no, for two reasons. One, the young people are really getting critically ill at a higher rate here in the U.S. We don't know why. We don't know those numbers. That's risky. And number two, we don't know about your risk of reinfection. That that data is evolving. What is your take on the most recent things you've seen as far as immunity post-infection and the likelihood of that? Uh, well, I was very concerned initially a, a few weeks ago because if, if that were true, even if it was a small chance, that would be of course, uh, a, a very bad prognosis for humanity and our economies. Uh, I'm not worried about that day to day anymore, largely because I think it was on March 16th, something like that, there was a, a published study that monkeys who were given uh, SARS-2 or, you know, COVID-19 disease uh, were not able to be reinfected. And I think that bodes well. Um, there were rumors out of China that you could be reinfected with super high doses, um, viral loads, but I haven't actually heard any evidence beyond that, that there might be reinfection. Um, have you two heard any of anything else? Just that one study that, that came out of China with like two case reports, but it seemed like the testing was questionable, um, in, in, at least in the study that I read. Well, that's good news. Yeah, I, I think that, that that's very unlikely, and experts that I've heard and talked to don't think that it's likely to be the case. Uh, I mean, right now, let, let's face it, we have enough problems to deal with. Um, let's not worry about that one. Um, can I uh, I'll just say some words about the young people getting infected? I think it's it's a natural defense response to say, you know, I'm, I'm Superman, bring it on. But I agree with you. It's, it's bad advice. First of all, you don't know how it's going to affect you. You've got different genetics. You've got different immune systems. You might have underlying asthma. You don't know uh, what could happen, and you don't want to overwhelm further the, the hospital systems. You don't want to be responsible for killing your parents or your grandparents. Imagine how you'd feel about that. And then the third one, which often isn't talked about, is that there's a real risk of doing permanent damage to your body. We're seeing fibrosis um, occur in the lungs. Uh, we It could be happening in the heart as well. And, and you know, maybe years to recover and potentially even decades before we know the long-term effects of having this disease. I think that's, that's great advice. One of the, one of the things that you've been using your Twitter account for David is commenting on potential treatments. Um, you've mentioned things like cancer drugs, haloperidol, metformin, hydroxychloroquine. Um, I'd like to ask you about every single one of those, but I, I recognize that we don't probably don't have the time to do that. So instead, I guess I'd like to ask you, if you got COVID today, would you take any of these potential treatments and, and why? Well, we, we have to be cautious because it, you probably saw the story that came out last night that a couple took fish tank cleaner thinking it was safe. Um, right. Do not dose at home. Whatever we say as scientists and doctors, um, this, is, this is not supposed to be for you to take your own health into your own hands. So that, first of all, that's the main thing. The chloroquine that we talk about is it has to be prescribed by a doctor. You cannot get it at home or from a pet store. Please don't do that. What would I do? Now, you know, I'm, I'm not a typical person because I, I will confess that I've, I've got you know, more knowledge and access than most people. But if I, if I had my wish list, what I would do is I'd 
I would love to have a home testing kit, which, as I mentioned, may not be possible anymore. Uh, then what would I take? Well, so what I'm taking right now before I got sick or before I'm getting sick is um, exercising, eating well, trying to fast at least once once a day. I'm doing three times a week exercise rather than one, getting my aerobic capacity up. So that's the baseline. Vitamin D, keeping that up. All right, so if I got it, um, I think, I mean, honestly, uh, but don't necessarily try this at home. I'm a scientist and I can monitor myself a little bit more than most. I'd probably try uh, some chloroquine um, if I had developed severe symptoms. If I just got a tickle in my throat, I'm not going to do that. But if I was starting to get a very strong fever and, and be coughing a lot, I might try that. Uh, but, but I do it with the knowledge that I've tried chloroquine before and I didn't have a negative reaction. But if you've never tried chloroquine, yeah, please be aware that there can be side effects. Yeah, And, and I'll just to mention... It, the, the the drug is called Placnil, uh, and it's hydroxychloroquine. It's not the chloroquine you can find at home typically. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. The hydroxy is better tolerated, and Mike actually did a full podcast with a PhD pharmacologist. So if, you, if anyone's listening to this and they haven't listened to that, there's a whole litany of contraindications and issues and problems. So just heed Dr. Sinclair's advice and don't play doctor on yourself at home. There are real risks associated with the medication. David, if you had um, any other kind of advice to give people, people listen to you, people respect you. Um, I think you've made the point about social distancing in general. I think it was a great point you made about um, don't get sick if you're young, because even though as great as our hospital system is normally, we're almost entering a, a developing world type of situation. So you don't want to be sick in the hospital. Is there any other advice that you think people just aren't talking about enough that we really need to get the message out about? Yeah, the, there's one thing that people aren't talking about. I mean, there's there's enough about hand washing and herd immunity. There's enough about um, being careful what you touch, use your elbow, use your hand covered in a sleeve, use your knuckle if you have to. That That's all that's out there. But what's what's not being talked about is uh, there's now a, a lot of evidence, contrary to what I was thinking, that humidity plays a key role in uh, viral infection. Now, I, I was of the impression before I researched this that um, having dry air would be good because the viral droplets that come out of your mouth will evaporate um, and hopefully kill the virus. And I thought that's what was going on in summer. It turns out it's the opposite. Uh, and, and this has practical implications. What... Um, it's now shown in many animal studies of, of guinea pigs and mice and rats is that if the humidity is optimal for your lungs, which is around 50% relative humidity, uh, animals and humans, and including school children that have been studied, are more resistant to viral infection. And the reason is that you have this mucus lining that covers the, the ciliary hairs in your lungs that help wipe away any particles, including viral particles, and that's true for the back of your throat um, as well, um, you have this mucus layer. And that mucus will seemingly, based on the evidence, pre prevent the virus from getting contact with the ACE2 um, enzyme on the outside of your epithelial cells. So what does that really mean practically? Well, there was a study of um, Midwestern uh, businesses uh, workplaces and New York apartments. And in winter, the relative humidity was down on average um, at 24. And that's those numbers are what really make animals and probably us highly susceptible to viral infection because the mucus has dried up and our lungs are more susceptible. Um, and even really, really high levels of 60 plus percent relative humidity are bad as, as well. So what does that mean? It means um, if you have a humidifier, I, I'd turn it on. Um, don't have dry. Um, if it's nice outside, you know, open a window. Um, if it's cold outside, don't open the window as much because you can lose a lot of moisture um, in the middle of winter by doing that. But essentially, if you feel, you know, like it's it's pretty dry in your house and your eyes are a little bit dry and, you know, the usual signs that we get in winter, a bit of a dry throat when you wake up in the morning, um, I'd consider getting a humidifier or, or buying one off online to, to keep that up. And it looks like temperature probably plays a role too. So that's actually hopefully some good news for the, the coming summer, right? 
you're a physician or scientist and you want to dig more into that, there was a, an article on annual review of virology, seasonality of viral infections that you could Google. It was just published like four days ago going over that, that science. And I think it is, we've been talking about all the negative downsides, and I think it is kind of a hopeful thing that as we're approaching summer, hopefully is going to give us a little bit of relief. It doesn't mean you can go outside and start going to bars and concerts again immediately, but, but it is something at least. Yeah, you know, the, there's there's doomsday, as we say, it makes no difference. Look at hot countries, they're still getting infected like Australia. Uh, but it, do, it does seem to temp, increase temperature and relative humidity correlate with lower spread across the world right now. Um, and the calculation that was done by some Chinese scientists was that for every increase in temperature by one degree Celsius and humidity by 1%, it lowers the R0, the infection rate, uh, by about between 0.2 and 0.4, which is significant if it's true. And I'm optimistic that as temperatures warm up in the northern hemisphere, we'll, it'll help us slow this down. But it doesn't help the southern hemisphere where it may spread more and therefore uh, be a reservoir for it to come back later in the year. So, uh, David, here's a, a question from one of our listeners who posted on, on Instagram. They want to know if there's any more clarity around the mechanism of disease progression. Uh, specifically, they're talking about the difference between, uh, I think, respiratory disease, GI, cardiac, and then what might be causing some people to get the severe form of COVID while others are mild or asymptomatic. As I understand it, the, there's two main processes going on. One is uh, increased viral load in the body, um, and also towards the end of, end stages of the disease, you can have the cytokine storm, which is the overreaction to all of the viral particles. Now, I wasn't sure which was worse. I, I'm sure uh, anyone on the front lines with patients would have a, a clue of which is more important. But there was some data that came out um, about three days ago that showed that the viral load in patients and the ability to bring that down again was critical for predicting whether a patient was going to be a severe case or a mild case. So what does that mean? That means that if the body can quickly um, kill off the cells that are infected and reduce the viral spread, um, and even better protect it from getting down into the lungs where you know it's migrating through the epithelial cells, then that's great. Then that means you're gonna do very well, but if it it goes deep and then the viral load goes high and stays high, then you've got the problem. So it's it really comes down to the ability of your immune system to clear the virus. Now, the cytokine storm is, is also important. Um, I don't have numbers yet on what percentage of patients succumb to that, but there's a there are cases where older people were doing seemingly well and um, stable with viral load being at least stable, if not dropping uh, and then they succumb within hours and that is seemingly due to the cytokine storm and there are drugs like Ectemra that can be used like uh, inhibiting the IL-6 receptor that uh, is useful in those cases. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of things we're learning about the biology of the virus um, and about the, the disease progression. Um, it's really not understood. You know, I study aging so I'm know a fair bit about what happens to the body as it gets older, um, including changes to the immune system. And it could be one of a number of molecular changes. For example, as you get older, you have um, more senescent cells in your immune system. So these are zombie-like cells that don't divide very well. Your uh, stem cells will lose their identity slowly. We think aging is largely a, a loss of information inside cells so they don't remember what to do correctly. I call that the information theory of aging. And there are other similarly esoteric kind of things like uh, the glycosylation pattern on proteins, uh, sugars that are added to proteins, whether they be antibodies or even the spike protein is glycosylated. They That may change how the disease develops, but we won't know that for sure until scientists have a chance to analyze the samples and correlate that with disease outcomes or patient outcomes. So if someone could stop aging for a little while, that'd probably be helpful to them during this pandemic. No doubt. I mean, that, that, there's no question in my mind that the, the main reason that people are succumbing is that they've got an older biological clock. No, they've got diseases like 
diabetes, type 2 diabetes and heart disease. But those, as I wrote in my book, uh, those are symptoms of, of the aging process. Uh, and so if we were able to stay healthy at 80 and 90, um, you, you wouldn't be having um, this, this fatality rate. There's no question about that. I, I'd be interested, you know, when the, all this dies down and we're doing the autopsy of, of this event, uh, to measure the biological clock of patients that recovered and those that didn't do well. And I, I would bet my uh, reputation that it's going to be a very close connection between your biological age uh, and your susceptibility, more so than just uh, your chronological age based on your birthday candles. I think a really interesting thing, too, since so many people are doing the biologic age test, will be to look and see what kind of change, because because of a large percentage of us are going to to catch this virus uh, and the change before and after getting the virus. It'd be interesting to see how that affects biologic age as well. Mm-hmm. It could, and it, it could age your immune system quicker as well if it has to respond so much and divide. All the stem cells will have to ramp up. Yeah, it's possible. Well, let's let's hope not, um, because it's possible many of us will catch this, as you say. One of, one of the most amazing things to me about this entire process is the the speed at which all the literature is coming out. And the, uh, you know, I, I saw an article the other day that showed that there was sixty nine potential drugs that could be could be used to treat treat this disease. And it, it's just amazing to me how quickly the scientific community has wrapped itself around this disease process and how much data we're being flooded with. And it's, uh, you know, it's to scientists like you that I think we need to be appreciative and, and say thank you for stopping your your day to day lab and what you normally do, which is, you know, study and, and, and help find cures for aging uh, and, and take your time to help curate this information for the general public and for the, for the educated listeners that we have on the podcast. So thanks. Thanks for what you're doing, David. I think it really matters. Uh, well, I appreciate it. It's the least I can do. I'm not really putting my life on the line for this, but I have some skills. I'm putting them to use. Um, I'm a communicator as well. So I'm trying to help there. Uh, I'm, I'm do- using my knowledge in molecular biology. So I'm tracking every day to give you an idea of what my day is like. I'm tracking the mutations that are occurring. You can track these at nextstrain.org. And uh, there are some strains now that have five different mutations within them. Um, one strain of Belgian virus. What does that mean? Uh, we don't know. I mean, typically RNA viruses like this one and the flu, um, they mutate themselves out of existence. So that seems to be what's currently happening. It's mutating at a rate that I've never seen in, in, in any other pathogen. Uh, to give you an example, this thing is mutating. Uh, a, new, a new mutation comes up every few days. If you look at something like measles, it mutates once every few years. Uh, so this is a very different beast. But the worry is maybe one of these mutations is going to come that's going to make the vaccine ineffective or it's going to be more lethal. And that's what I'm trying to get my head around. Um, and I'm learning a lot about the biology of this virus. A lot of people, uh, nobody I know is talking in detail about the biology of this virus, at least publicly. It's a really complicated machine. You know, you can't call it a life form, but it's it's got uh, it's got ten main genes, and within those genes, uh, particularly genes number one and number two, are divided up into another set of genes, and they all interact and they make an RNA here, and then it jumps and it moves down here, and then it can flip over and start reading the other way. This is a mean machine. Um, highly evolved, probably been around with us for billions of years, jumping between species, mutating as fast as it can. And uh, that's what makes it so scary. This this thing seems to be popping out more frequently in the 21st century. And um, it's important that we understand the biology more than ever. We want to be respectful of your time. We uh, We really look forward to getting back to talking to you about longevity instead of a global pandemic. Hopefully we'll be there sooner rather than later but i think the biggest risk for you right now is your kids killing yourself like killing themselves like <laughs> like like you mentioned so we don't we don't want that uh, that blood to be on our on our hands so yeah. we appreciate you joining us um people can sign up for your newsletter at lifespanbook.com um if they want to follow you on instagram and twitter and other places what's the best way to follow your work 
Uh, yeah, the newsletter comes out. I'm writing that now once a week uh, instead of once a month. Um, and you can get the previous edition uh, if you sign up. Twitter is David A. Sinclair, and Instagram is David Sinclair PhD. Um, and so in, in my book, you might remember if, if, uh, if you can, that I said there's no point extending lifespan if a pandemic wipes most of us out. Uh, and I wrote a whole chapter on pandemics and why that's just as important to figure out and prepare for as chronic diseases. Um, you know, clearly, as we started out saying in this conversation, you know, I wish more people had either read that chapter or listened to people like Bill Gates and others who have been sounding the warning. But I'm pretty sure we're not going to make this mistake again. Yeah, that was on page 143, paragraph two, if anybody. No, I'm just kidding. I'm a fan of the book, but not that big of a book. Yeah. No, this, uh, if, you're, if you're quarantined or you're socially isolated, it's a great time to read. <laughs> so, it's so, a good but, book to pick up there, around now. Uh, David, want, just want, one, one, one last question, because I can't help myself. This is probably the, maybe the nerdiest question of the entire interview, but um, I, this is your space, so I feel like I have to ask you, have you, got, have you gotten any more information regarding genetic polymorphisms and risk of disease? Um, I, I'm aware of at least some data in, in 15 ACE2 SNPs, and then there's one in, a, in what's called the um, uh, IFITM3. Uh, protein, which is uh, basically an interferon-induced protein that helps prevent viral adherence. But those are the only the only two that I'm currently aware of. Have you seen anything else? Uh, those are the two. But the interesting thing would be is if uh, people have done their full ge genome, we could get their genotype. They could send that in or tell us their genotype and how if they've contracted the disease um, and the severity. And that way we could have initially some idea if there's some correlation but right now i'm unaware of any evidence that your polymorphisms your variants of ace2 make a difference i mean it, it may make a difference but then again it may not because the the spike protein docks with ace2 very strongly at multiple places and slight variations may not help but i think we could figure that out initially through social media and then follow it up with uh, sequencing of patient samples it's a good yeah. idea the, the data that I've seen has mostly been um, out of the SARS-1 virus, so we would have to sort of make a bit of a jump from SARS, you know, COVID-1 to COVID-2. We do know that the the attachment is the same, as, as my understanding, um, with the spike protein attaching to the ACE2 receptor, correct? Uh, well, yeah, but at the molecular level, there's a lot more contacts being made with this virus and um, the spike protein in ACE2. So uh, those of you who cannot see my hand, I've got a cupped hand and a fist going into it, the original SARS, it touched just one side of, of the hand with the fist, but this one's really jammed, wedged in the in the fit the fist into the hand. So it's it's a tougher problem and it may be difficult to find not just genotypes that make a difference, but even drugs that try to block that interaction. Um, so this is this is a bit of a more, more formidable foe than the original SARS. Um, and not not just because the, the the receptor is a tighter, well, the spike protein is binding more tightly to the enzyme ACE2, but it's also formidable because uh, the symptoms don't come out in this disease for four days, and uh, that's enough time to infect people. So that's a, I know I'm jumping around, but it's a good thing to remind everybody that you will not feel sick initially when you get this disease, um, and it's even more important especially for young people, not to go out there and come back home and give it to their family members. I think that's a really good idea that you had to, to, to put this on social media and see if anyone has their genome and is willing to share it with us and if they've had COVID and we can try to maybe run some small numbers and see if, see if we pick up anything. I think that would be great. Yeah, we'll put out the coordinates for ACE2 uh, and the ITM3 uh, gene so people can send us what their variants are. Um, and we could perhaps build up a database ahead of people getting the infection potentially. And, and as people get it, then they could alert the database. But let's work on that. I like Just that. Got it. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time again. That was, that was an excellent conversation. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks so much for listening to this COVID-19 update. Please send us your questions or follow along on Instagram and Facebook at WildHealthMD. 
And just to be clear, this is not medical advice. No patient-physician relationship has been established, and this resource is really for general informational purposes only. And finally, if you want to spread the word, please send this podcast to friends and family and give us a review on iTunes. Thanks again, and stay safe.